It is a brand new edition of Flyers Daily, a Monday edition. You all know what that means. We'll talk about that in a second after I tell you that Flyers Daily is presented by Ticketmaster. Make more memories live every Monday, season, in season, postseason, out of season, you name it. He joins us on Mondays from PhiladelphiaFlyers.com, NHL.com, and HockeyBuzz.com. It is Bill Melter. Bill, did you have a good Father's Day? I did. How about you? I had a very good one, although my the good news about the video, if you're watching this on YouTube, is you can't see the lower third, as I like to call it, the D zone, because uh, it is burnt. I spent the day on a four-hour, four-plus-hour kayak run down. It's called Butler's Run, uh, uh, the east branch of the Brandywine River. And for, like, the last hour of it, I was the guy that was getting towed on the tube. So my legs are like <laughs> lobsters, and they're just burning like <laughs> yeah. crazy right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good time, and uh, all the dads funny. out there, uh, happy Father's Day. A lot of great hockey dads out there. It was one of the greatest bonds I had with my dad. So many mornings uh, getting in the car when it was still dark to go to rink A or rink B all over the place, and uh, he carded me all over the place. We love the hockey moms, but we love the hockey dads as well. A lot of great ones out there. Oh, yeah. yeah my, my father, uh, you know, he grew up a Rangers fan because uh, he was born in '46. So the, the the flyers didn't exist till he was twenty. Yeah. So uh, you know, and unfortunately, kept that loyalty somehow. He was. We were texting back and forth. You know, <laughs> he was rooting for the Rangers in the uh, you know conference final against Florida, and I was telling him Flor Florida was going to take this with the better team. But anyway, 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 happy Happy Father's Day, belatedly to, to all the dads out there. Bill, does does the fact that Pabrowski got pulled do in any way, shape, or form? damages chances at a con smith I, I look at it somebody texted me i said no it doesn't at all uh it's yeah. one of those games that just climbed on top of the team i mean yeah. how's he supposed to make that first save his defenseman montour yeah. leaves his feet and takes him out um i, I don't think it damages any chance i think they're going to win the cup in five and coming up tomorrow night and yeah. it, he'll be the con smith winner i i think probably so if not him maybe barkov mm -hmm. some of the matchups he's, he's been in and he's had a great playoffs but uh Yes, quite often it'll go to the goalie, and, and I don't think it diminishes his candidacy at all. You know, you're going to have those outlier games. But better you have the the one game where you're just just not in it. You know, than uh, you know than than you let in a couple soft ones that cost you games over the course of the series. That was just that was just a game that Florida was not going to win that game. It was just, just yeah, just one of those nights. And they, you know, that that's you're up you're up three nothing. You have four games to win one. So you know, back at it, game five. Yeah, they're in a great spot, obviously. Um, in this episode, Bill, we're going to tackle a, a kind of a, like we did last week, kind of a potpourri of topics as we're kind of in this in-between season of waiting for the cup to finalize. We're going to get the schedule here in the next couple of weeks. We're going to have the draft coming up on the 28th and 29th. Then free agency is going to begin. Then we'll go back into kind of a transitional period of ticking down days and, and waiting for the season. Um, but one thing I wanted to bring up is, you know, last week uh, on Friday's episode, and I know you wrote a profile piece as well, um, I featured my conversation from Exit Day with Nick Sealer. And, you know, when, I, when I'm doing these interviews, it's right after the season. I go back and watch them before I do the episode. And, and watching Nick say, he has such a critical quote in there about extending here. They know who I am as a player. Um, they know what I'm all about. And it really got me thinking because you've covered a lot of players for a lot of years covering this game as if I – and you've talked to a lot of pairs from different eras, but one thing never changes. If, and I think it's I, – I can't underscore how important I think it is in a rebuild to have guys like Nick Sealer that have so much character because, you know, young guys like Tyson Forster or Noah Cates, young guys in their career, they I think they need to be exposed. They need the exposure of players like Nick Sealer who almost was done with hockey at a crossroads – it's got a four-year contract that's kicking in next year. Like you couldn't be happier for the guy, but I think that that culture that he brings is almost as important as the players you draft and the way you develop them in a in a in a rebuild. If you're going to do it properly, you got to have those guys. No, no, absolutely. Um, and and you can look at you know at any team that wins, they have you know, sometimes a couple of those guys. You know the um, I, mean, I guess the the catch-all word is the glue guys, but it's you know, I think every team needs them. The, the guys that have that were that weren't high end draft picks, the guys the guys that had to work simply to have a role in the league. Um, you know, to I I think that uh, I think those players they can they they set an example through usually through work ethic 
through, mm -hmm. you know, through they, they, they merge as leaders over time. They do a lot of they do a lot of the tasks that aren't glamorous, but everybody needs to chip in sometimes to do. And um, particularly particularly being, being a, a guy like Sealer in particular, where you know, he's so uh, insightful, off the ice, very laid back most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, on the ice, he's, he's the opposite. He's so intense, so competitive. And uh, I think that resonates with everybody in the room. You, you, you definitely need a couple of those guys on any team. Uh, and who, you know, I mean, they know what it's like to be scratched, right? They, they know what it's like to, to live on the bubble of a roster. And, you know, in, in, in Nick's case, this past year, he worked his way up to being a second pair guy over the course of the season. And he really, he really held down that fort, you know, for the team. Um, that pairing up till the trade deadline, you know, because Sealer got hurt and Walker was traded, you know, that that was a big loss. That was a big loss. And and it was uh, – it definitely affected the Flyers' blue line in the latter part of the season to, to really lose both those guys. I mean, Sealer ultimately came back late in the season. Uh, I, I think that – I think those guys who, you know, I – You'll, you'll never you'll never know by looking at their their raw stats or sometimes for some guys even their underlying numbers, but but those guys are important members of a team and and Sealer is one of those guys that just just so easy to root for you know yeah. and, uh, and and I, and and his, and his team his teammates pick up on it too. I mean you know I don't you you could go to one guy in that room who thinks he's anything other than than a key part of the team and he is. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is, you know, teams that, that turn into great teams or, you know, cup contenders, um, even though some of those players may not be on their team, they were there when they were building um, yeah. as, as an example to young guys like Nathan McKinnon, you know, had those examples in Colorado early in his career and, and other great young players have those guys around. I, I think it's one of the gifts that Crosby's given a lot of guys in Pittsburgh that have come through there as young players. Uh, I think it's the gift that a guy like Marshan and Bergeron gave to a lot of guys on the Boston Bruins. And even though, you know, Bergeron's not there, that's still yielding a result and a return. Because I think that those elements um, are, you know, the way you work, the way you carry yourself, your professionalism, I think, is is because you can't measure it in stats. You, you, yeah. it, it's it, you need those guys, a particular in a rebuild so you don't let anything slip. Because if you allow things to slip when you're young, they're going to slip when you're older. And I know like Joe Watson, he wouldn't let things slip in a, in a beer league game yeah. or an alumni yeah, sure. game. And there's been guys over generation and generation from, from Watson through the, the 80s and the 90s that I think that that is just so important in having guys like that around. Um, Bill, one of the interesting things, we, you know, we, we saw another signing this week from Danny Briere and the Flyers, and they've signed a couple guys, uh, um, Abel and uh, Eklund, over the last couple of weeks. And to me, I look at these signings and go, okay, these are both, like, you know, mature players at this point looking for another shot in the NHL. Um, and I go, okay, is this going to be something that fixes the Flyers' problems? Probably not. Um, if you can find a Michael Roffel type player in there that's got a role, that you're getting a mature player at a young player ELC cost is a big thing. But to me, the big thing here is this is Danny Briere tipping his hand, if you really look with your you know secret decoder ring, that they're not going to be active in the UFA market. This yeah. is how they're going to handle the UFA market. If one or both of these guys work out as contributors, great. If they don't, it was absolutely worth the risk. Yeah, for sure. It, it's it's nothing venture, nothing lost. You know, you're mm -hmm. you're uh, they're on one year, two way contracts. Uh, they'll have an opportunity, and that's the only thing that's big promised them is an opportunity. Uh, you know, if, if they end up playing for the Phantom, so be it. If they if they end up contributing on the big team, so be it. They definitely add a piece of depth to, to the lineup. They add some size. Um, you know, and that's kind of what both guys have in common. They're, they're big frame guys, as you said, uh, a little bit, you know, they're mature in their development. Um, you know, in Abel's case, you're talking about a guy who's pretty fair amount of international experience. Uh, played a little bit in the American League, played junior hockey over here, played, you know, so he, he's played, he's played a lot of, you know, a lot. You know, he's played some 
and, and gets a pretty good grades of competition. Now, whether whether he can stick in the NHL lineup or not, I don't know. We'll see. Um, but you know, I, I think that one one thing an organization has to be able to do is you have to be able to come up with some of these guys. The Flyers have done that. You're not gonna you're not gonna hit on everybody, of course. But you, know, you mentioned Michael Waffle, Pierre Edward Belmar, still around the NHL now. He was another guy came over from Europe as an older player. Yeah. Nothing promised him, but other than a chance, I uh, remember being in the room the day he made the NHL. He he wouldn't believe it yeah. uh, until he was he was told that. I mean, he, you know, we, we congratulated him. He said, "Don't guys, don't say that, don't say that." He said, "Well, we saw the list of cuts. Uh, your name isn't on. You're on the team." Yeah. And he's like, "Well, I, I'll believe it when I hear you know when I hear it." And of course, he's, he's never gone down. He's been the been, been the NHL ever since, and he's been a, he's been a valuable player too for a number of teams at this point. Yeah, if you really can come up with a couple still. of those guys, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And in, in, in Belmar's case, in particular, um, you know, you can come up with a couple of those guys, particularly when they're they're low cost options, and they, you know, these guys always feel like they're proving themselves. We, we were just talking about with, you know, with Nick Sealer. Um, these these guys have never had anything handed to them, so they they know what it's like to have to battle for a spot, earn their keep, and. If they make it, great, and and if they don't, well, they you know they'll pass through the organization and however long they're they're here. But it's uh, I th- I think a couple of those signings can be pretty good under the radar um, for for a team. Um, I I don't think you know I don't think there's any expectation those guys are going to tear it up or be top of the lineup guys even if they do make the NHL. But you know you need guys who can come in and, and, and play different roles. And the Flyers were also looking for a little bit more size up front anyway. So yeah. you know, those guys, they, they might check some boxes. We'll see. We'll see by their play. Yeah, it tips the hand to me of a very prudent approach to free agency this offseason, yeah. which I applaud. Like, 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 let's not go out there and go crazy with, you know, rising cap and all that. This re- year is a year where you really, if you remain prudent, you investigate that hockey market, the trade market. Yeah. Um, and if there's something that presents itself that makes a ton of sense and more, then you, then you do it. But, um, you know, one of the things, the big – question marks going into the season was Sean Couturier, Bill. Um, and the way he got out of the gate, I think, surprised a lot of people. I know it surprised me. I, I, I'm watching him play, and I'm going, okay, well, he's never been the most fleet of foot. He's never been the fastest guy. But he just thinks the game so well, such great hockey IQ and anticipatory skills. And then all of a sudden, you know, in January, it seemed, started seeing his face-off percentage drop. And then, you know, he really struggled to score points, and his minutes plummeted below 14 minutes a game. And obviously that led uh, to the healthy scratch and a ton of conjecture as he shot. Uh, Well, we did find out this past week when he appeared on Nasty Knuckles' podcast that he had a sports hernia surgery right after the season. And, I mean, to me this was about the least shocking breaking news I've seen all summer (laughs) because you could see that he was dealing with something either groin – core something like that because yeah. of the lack of burst and the face-off dot is very telling to me i go either wrist or core when, when i see yeah. a, a guy who's a really good yeah. face-off guy suffer um but uh he apparently has been rehabbing and the rehab process is over he's going to begin his training so that's that's good news for sure it, it puts a season in a lot of perspective yeah you know you can almost pinpoint exactly where it was too you know, like well, after after his forty first game, uh, which is his midpoint of the season, he missed a couple games, of course, in the in the first half. Yeah, and but was. he was he had twenty nine points through through his first forty one games, basically three points every four games. And after after a year and a half away from you know away from the game, or at least away from playing, you know, to get three points every four games and do the other things he was doing and playing twenty minutes a night. Mm-hmm. You know that that was that was really a best case scenario, which you could you could hope. I mean, it almost almost it was almost unfair to expect that much. Um, and then, you know, he missed two games. It was during that road trip. Um, Flyers went in and they they won in Winnipeg without him, and they won in St. Louis without him. Uh, so he missed the two games there. And the kind of the word of the time was it was a, a groin or lower lower core kind of issue. Um, and he only missed the two games, but when he came back, he it still didn't look right, and he never quite got right. So you, yeah. you could almost you could almost pinpoint right there mid January yeah. something 
something was a line of demarcation to the eye test yeah yeah and 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 it was and it never i mean you know there were stretches where it looked better but it it never it never got back to where it was um and and so everything kind of went the way it went for the rest of the season so the fact that he 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 he, you know he admitted after the season and and the the thing of course with katori is he never he'll never bring up injuries uh, unless you you ask him about it and even then does he he'll downplay it um you remember remember the 2018 playoffs where he was playing through a pretty serious knee injury and you wouldn't know you wouldn't would have known it by watching him play but you know he really shouldn't have been playing but but he did he you know he played well never makes excuses he never does no. and um you know so he was he was never going to to say oh well it's you know it's because i haven't been 100 percent you know he put it in his own play um so it doesn't surprise me at all hopefully you know be, because because sports hernia surgeries can be a little tricky and coming back from and you have to rehab it right and make sure that you are healthy when you come back um you know, and I thankfully got it early enough to where he should be okay for camp and hopefully get through it and whatever, you know, even if he has a little bit of a slow start, he should be, he should be fine as the season goes along. Just hopefully it's, it's nothing recurring. That's all. Yeah. I, I look at that and I go, that's good news. Um, not that he had a surgery, but, uh, it explains a lot and again, yeah. not shocked to hear it. And he's such, he's a throwback type player. Like he's never going to mention Boo about an injury anywhere, in or immediately around a season. Um, he's not the type of guy that's ever going to make excuses. Um, so uh, we hope the best for his recovery and uh, uh, heading into next season that he comes in full tilt, ready to go for training camp. Although he probably want to skip that first day with that rope on the ice. But uh, <laughs> I imagine the boys. Like I thought about I'm looking at the calendar, and, and I'm going, "Oh my goodness, it's June 16th, June 17th." That's about the time guys are going to start start ramping a little bit. Yeah. In particular, yeah. when you get to July first, but um, in advance of that skating test that's coming coming up on uh, yeah. the first day of camp, uh, and that and that rope that I know all those players would like to wrap around torts and uh, squeeze them to death with uh, on that day. Um, Bill, one of the things you know with Couturier, we had during the season was there over usage? Was the schedule wearing him down because he didn't play for twenty one months? Well, we're going to get the schedule released. I think last year it came out on, I think, on the 29th, just after the draft. Um, and, and we usually get it before free agency. Once we get the cup final uh, done and dusted, which should be this next couple of days, uh, we'll get the schedule released for next year. And one of the things, one of the kind of quirks of last year's schedule was that all of their out-of-time zone travel was loaded into the first, I, I would say, 55 games. Yeah. You got to the point late where it was okay. They're not going. They're going to leave the time zone twice. I think they were going to maybe St. Louis and and Dallas or something like that. Uh, and while that's good to have that relief on the backside, I, it's one of those things that I, I I talk about a lot is don't empty the tank because you may not get anything back in the tank. Um, I'd like to see that a little bit more balanced for them this year. Plus, I think a road trip and a western trip at a certain time can be really good for a team but you couple that this year they're gonna have the four nations cup in montreal and boston i believe and and you know that's going to be a pause in the schedule from the 12th of february to the 20th of february but i'd like to see that a little bit more balanced if i could make a a plea to the league to to kind of balance the travel a little bit better instead of front loading it as much certainly don't back load it but don't front load it as much no that 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 to me is half the half of it too is you have these stretches of, you know because of the four nations you have that built-in long break you know to me sometimes you're sometimes within the course of the season you have almost too many off days at certain points and yeah. then you don't have nearly enough in other times you, you might you might have like uh you know 15 games in 30 days or or 16 in you know 32 days or whatever the, the case might be and that uh, that it may not wear you down at first, but there's a cumulative effect that you, you feel it on, on the, the other side of it sometimes. To me, I would like to see, you know, little breaks uh, over the course of the season, not not stretches where you're particularly early in the season. I feel early in the season, there's there's a lot of times you'll you might go three or four nights without a game, and I'd like to I'd like to actually have a game or two in there so later on you you're not slammed, 
Uh, yeah. You know, and, so you don't and, have sixteen and thirty I mean, like it, they had in, this, in March this year. It's sixteen games in thirty right. days. Yeah, and and particularly when the I I, I think that was you know it's not, obviously it's not the whole thing, right? <laughs> that, mm. that 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 would be ridiculous to say that, but I do think that was one of the factors where they hit a, they hit a wall near the end. Yeah. Um, they still they still need to dig deeper and fare better in a lot of those games against bottom teams. That that, yep. that doesn't change the bottom line there, but I do think that was a factor. Yeah, uh, so we'll see what the schedule has got uh, in order for the Flyers. Um, last thing, Bill, you know, last off season and heading into it at the end of the year, I remember his end of season media availability. John Tortorella talked about, you know, kind of the plan for the off season, and he used the word first order of business is subtraction, and then the second order of business will be to backfill. Don't expect the big splashy names in free agency. You know, we're in a rebuild and we're going to have to subtract some pieces to move forward and we're going to have to backfill with some guys that can kill penalties like Garnet Hathaway was a good example of that. Um, and we ended up seeing a, a, a very significant amount of of high-end turnover with Provorov and Hayes, D'Angelo, James Van Riemsdyk. I mean, it wasn't just, you know, big presences on the bench and on the ice, but it was also big presences of personality and you know, importance to culture in that locker room with a guy like Van Riemsdyk, who's the player rep and all that. Um, but when we look at this offseason, I, I don't know if we've really kind of quantified, you know, what the numbers look like in turnover. Is the number greater than four significant pieces that they turn over this offseason? I mean, the, the likeliest candidates that I came up with, and these are kind of in some order, not really, but Atkinson, uh, Faraby, Lawton, Delarie, Ristolainen, uh, Zamula, and, and I put Konechny and Couturier on there. I don't think these are going anywhere, but uh, are those the most likely candidates? And what do you think about volume of, of turnover this offseason? I think it'll be moderate. Um, and I, I, I think the Flyers definitely have their eyes and ears open for hockey trades mm-hmm. where you might end up moving somebody who's not on that list just because it's what it takes to get a deal done to fill, you know, fill another need. Hockey wise, um, uh, I think that it did. One thing that's pretty clear is that they, they like what the room is. So they're, I mean, that, that I don't think that's a factor this year about subtracting guys in that sense. Um, and I, 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 you know, there's always, there's always, of course, is the money considerations too, as to the fire, the fires are a year away from being pretty in, in good cap shape. If, if they ha- if they handle this right, they'll have a lot of expiring contracts. Obviously, some they'll have to figure out: is, is he going to stay here long term? Is he going to be here beyond the season? That kind of thing. I'm, I'm thinking, for example, Frost comes up as, as a restricted free agent next year. Next year to be decision time as to whether you extend him for multiple years or whether maybe you move on at that point, depending on the year he has, depending on how other things take shape. Um, and and it could happen sooner, depending on based on what hockey trades are out there. Um, I think the guys that you mentioned are all guys who might move, who, who might be moved. Um, but I think it would have to be would have to be a trade that makes sense, that makes the Flyers better in some way. Um, so I don't I don't see a ton of I don't see a ton of changeovers. And you know, a, a lot of times you you go to draft weekend, even in July, and you're talking about trades and um, flyers are, you know, they're not dealing from the, the same position of weakness that they were a year ago, like with Kevin Hayes. Yeah. Where, I mean, it was, listen, the flyers had to take a short term loss on that where they're eating half the contract. You're only getting back, I think a sixth round pick, you know, that, that, that was, that was the kind of trade that you're kind of forced into making um, this year. I think if there are hockey trades to be made that they think makes sense, um, Maybe makes it a little stronger down the middle. Maybe maybe another guy they feel could slot uh, on at least the second pairing, and you maybe move other pieces around. I think you could see that. Um, as we've we've been discussing, I don't think they're going to dive headfirst into free agency by any means. In fact, they might they might not do much more than sign guys on two way deals. We talked about that earlier. Yeah. Um, guys who could step in and play for the Phantoms or the Flyers as depth pieces. Um, I think they're. If they can't get hockey trades done, I think a year from now might be when they start looking at some free agents who might 
be able to come in and, and make a bit of an impact. So uh, I'm not expecting a, a ton. Uh, hopefully things develop in a way where you're able to make some moves in the trade market that, that can help the team take the next step. And, and, and the way I'm defining next step, and we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, um, is it's not necessarily making the playoffs. And it's not necessarily coming up with, you know, I, I think the Flyers could once again have about 87, 88 points, 86 points. We're right, right in that same range they had this past year. The, the difference is, is that th- this year to have 91 points and be a playoff team, that was the cutoff this year. That's a rare. Most years, that's not. Yeah, mo- most year the most years the cutoff is about 95 points. Yeah. So 95, the Flyers would have. If the Flyers were to have 88 points, but the cutoff is 95 or so, you're going to miss the playoffs by more points than you missed the previous year. So that's not, you know, success in that regard. But I think you're continuing to evolve in that way. I think I think the the main focus still has to be on the bigger picture and the longer term. But I think they can take another step in that direction with one piece of that, one big piece of that being getting your cap in good shape for a year from now when you have a lot of contracts coming off the books. Yeah, and obviously part of the turnover will depend on if uh, Matthew Michkoff comes over as well because that's, sure. uh, there's, that's a guaranteed roster spot for the most part. Um, you know, one of the guys that I'm really curious about is Rasmus Ristolainen. To me, this is like, all right, he's playing on the right side on a top pair with Cam York. Sanheim and Drysdale are your second pair. Sanheim back on the left side. And then Sealer with somebody on the right side. Maybe, you know, that's some combination of Adder, Eric Johnson. I don't know. Uh, in your third pair, but if Ristolainen is not going to play in my top four D, I, I got to find a way to move him. Um, I, to me, he's the, he's a player's name that's shrouded in mystery for me right now. I I always look at players and go, well, did the current administration extend him? You know, did they have skin in the game? And while they don't, because that was a trade and extension by Chuck Fletcher. I do remember, yeah. you know, when they acquired him and Keith Jones, the president, was still a broadcaster and we had dinner every night before games, uh, that he was fond of the player. So, yeah. uh, but I just don't know where that stands right now. It's To me, it's one of the great mysteries of this offseason because he just kind of, poof, disappeared this year with, a, with an injury. We didn't see him on exit. You know, there was a lot of things. I just don't know where things stand with him. And then last year, he, I mean, he came in and he had military service. Like, yeah, like what's going on here? It, it was definitely a, a very weird season. Um, I, I think one of the most interesting things that's happened with the Flyers over the last two seasons uh, has been the, the effect that Brad Shaw has had with Ristolainen. Ristolainen, um, you know, when when he was playing, after, after that slow start at the beginning of the season when the Flyers were – during that long spell when the Flyers were in a playoff spot, Ristolainen was actually playing really, really well. Yeah. Um, I, I think he was perfectly slotted in the lineup. and But also, Brad Shaw changed his game to a large extent. You know, you, you even look at the year before that where you know, Ristolainen would lead the NHL in hits. And, uh, you know, but it was, it was at the cost of getting himself out of position a lot. Yeah, he put and guardrails on his game. They put a ton of guardrails and added a lot of structure. Yep. to what he does. And he was way more effective. He didn't hit as much. He still hit when it was there, but uh his all-around game was much more effective because he wasn't you know, he wasn't 4 or 5 feet out of the play along running himself into the wall, missing a check, and now all of a sudden it's 2 on 1 down low. I, to me he has to he has to pick up at that point where he left off with that discipline with those guardrails on his game. And if he can do that, then I think he can still be a highly effective player. Um, I don't. I don't know if he can or if he will, though. I, I don't know what version of Ristolainen there will be. Not even just health wise, but in terms of his game. Yeah. Um, that, that to me is a big question mark going into next year. Uh, it's an area where they, you, you know, he can help the team a lot if it all works out, or it could be a situation where, you know, he's he, he's an expensive guy in and out of the lineup. Yeah. Um, and, and so we'll. We'll see, but to me, to me, he's definitely one of those X factor guys this summer. Yeah, I, to me, if it, if he can play with those guardrails on, and to me, the biggest thing for him is playing inside the dots. Yeah, he would roam too far to make a hit outside the the, the dots and outside of the middle of the ice, in particular defending the blue line. And if he can play inside the dots with ferocity, um, then you're getting the most out of that player. 
Uh, but if he's outside running around, it becomes net negative because you just give up too many. You put your partner in such a bad situation uh, when you over pursue, for, in particular for physicality. Um, so we'll see. It's, it's one of the great mysteries of this offseason. Great stuff, Bill. Uh, Read Bill's work at PhiladelphiaFlyers.com, NHL.com, and HockeyBuzz.com. Uh, coming up on Wednesday's episode, we're going to feature Jamie Drysdale, the Flyers defenseman, in our Flyers Exit Day interview. And we'll also have Friday, Tyson Forster. So Bobby Brink and Noah Cates to come as well as we count down towards the draft. Everybody have a great Monday. We'll talk to you Wednesday on a brand-new Flyers Daily.